Welcome everybody to our 99th webinar of our series that we started back in March of 2020. This is the 25th of uh, 2021 that we have done. Um, been, been a very, very good run. It's been great, uh, lots of information, met lots of great people. And, uh, and today we are doing the same thing again. We have a, we have a, a, a guest with us that's gonna talk about motorcycle racing data. And that is uh, Chloe Lorin, and she's gonna come join us uh, and talk about um, um, motorcycle racing data, but, but we're gonna start off in this version and in this particular episode with in, you know, talking about a solo. Uh, solo two and how to you know some basics of getting it mounted you talk about the download stuff you know uh, and then of course uh, do do some basic data analysis here uh, the second half of this webinar and then uh, and that is just building to some more motorcycle racing data that uh, that Chloe's going to join us for for a couple of other episodes as we uh, as we go through the next couple of months so look forward to uh, to seeing what the what this is and how everybody uh, enjoys re watching and learning about uh, motorcycle racing data, but uh, for those of you that race cars or, or snowmobiles or UTVs, the concepts uh, are very much the same. I always want to make sure everybody understands that and, and appreciates that, and that uh, you know some of the different ways she's going to set up her screens and uh, and, and those kind of things. It's uh, uh, pr pretty interesting. So while uh, the last thing that we'll talk about as we're getting started is we are, we do have the presentation materials are available to you. This uh, PowerPoint uh, presentation, we've got it turned into a, um, a PDF file and that is available to it. Uh, I'm sure they'll stick it into the chat box here live uh, for those of you that are watching this live. Uh, if you're watching this on YouTube later, you, it, there are links down in the description box of the presentation of the data files that we're going to look at, the user profiles that, um, that uh, are used, the math channels that are used, and even the track map for Road America where we're going to be looking at the data. So all of the data, all of the setup that you need for this, uh, to, to watch this back on YouTube later and, and watch what she does and, uh, and be able to recreate it is, is available to you down in the, down in the uh, uh, description box of the YouTube. Okay, perfect. So let's uh, let's jump to the next screen and let's talk a little bit about Chloe. Have a, a quick introduction. She she's um, uh, I've been chatting with her for a little bit. Uh, she's a racing data engineer in the in the Moto America uh, series. So it, you know uh, one of the top series, obviously here in the states. She uh, she coaches motorcycles. She's a she's a enthusiast, a rider of motorcycles, a club racer. Uh, and, and she's an engineer that uh, works in, in, in the engine area. We'll let her uh, explain that a little bit more, but um, mechanical engineer. Um, she's um, uh, from France and uh, has been over here for a while. We'll let her kind of tell us a little bit more about that. And one of the things that she's done and, and, uh, and hopes to do a little bit more in the future is create some more educational videos, not only about, you know, hopefully about all about the AIM stuff, right? But, but uh, not just about the AIM stuff, but uh, Chloe, thank you for coming. I appreciate it very much. I know it's a lot of, uh, a lot of work to put these things together and uh, you've done a great job and, uh, and I welcome you. Hi everybody. Yeah, that's, that's really my pleasure. Thank you for, uh, for the opportunity. That's actually really awesome. I'm excited about uh, spending an hour with you. Uh, so like you said, my name is Chloe Larin. I am originally from France. I have moved to the States about seven years ago for grad school. So I went to the University of Wisconsin to study engines. Um, so I was working for uh, John Deere on big engines and really wanted to understand more about combustions, et cetera. Um, so did my master's in Wisconsin and then I stayed, I actually worked uh, in partnership with Harley Davidson uh, on a small V-twin engine during grad school and then completely moved to uh, more heavy, heavy duty, medium duty engines and it's basically what I'm doing now. Uh, so I'm working at Oak Ridge National Laboratory uh, doing research on um, internal combustion engines trying to make them cleaner and more efficient. Uh, but on the side, I do wear many hats uh, and so I started doing track days on my motorcycle actually when I started having a job and I had a little bit more money to spare, <laughs> uh, which is not too long ago. It was about three years ago. I had been riding motorcycles for about five, six years before, mostly in Europe. Um, started, you know, started track days, got sunk in right away. Uh, this became my world really, really, really fast. Uh, got the opportunity to start coaching for a track day organization about a year ago, I think, a year and a half ago. Um, and then um, I, you know, the nerd that I am wanted to do more 
understand what I was doing on my motorcycle. And we can talk about how I got into it maybe after, but um, got my first solo to DL and then started doing data analysis. And I found that it was really at the crossroad of my profession and my education, as well as my hobby. And so everything merged together perfectly. I started playing with my little solo and then uh, got the opportunity to work for a race team. So that's, uh, that's where we are now. And I started racing also this year. Perfect. And, and as we mentioned, uh, what we're going to look at today is basically this just the D GPS based channels of a solo or the internal se sensors as well, but uh, but not connected to the to the bike CCU or additional sensors. That's what we're going to kind of start with today and show the power of that. But in, uh, you know, in some of the other stuff you work with has a full on uh, MXL2 and 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 uh, and Correct. further data that we're going to actually uh, have you back for and, and do some other some other seminars at that point. So that'll be fun. Perfect. And um, the uh, uh, again, for those of you watching live, we have a question and answer box there. I forgot to mention it earlier. Uh, if you have a question that uh, that Chloe, you think Chloe uh, might be able to answer or you'd like to hear what she has to think about something, make sure you plug it into the question and answer box and we'll feed those in as we go through the uh, through the day. And then uh, we also make that file. We, we turn that into a document uh, for even those some of those that were answered uh, by our by our uh, aim text that, that are working with us here. Uh, if they do that by text, you know, uh, or uh, when we answer it, we'll link those questions to uh, where in the video uh, for you to find those uh, answers. So that'll be good. that'll be fun as well. So let's uh, let's start off a little bit. Uh, again, we're it, we're going to talk mainly about solo twos, but uh, in in this particular one, but we also wanted to start. Uh, just about how to mount them on a bike, some of the fights and some of the struggles that some people might have. So we're going to start with just a couple of slides where we actually talk about mounting them and, and, and some of the basics, and then we'll jump into some, uh, some data analysis. So I'll turn this over to you to, uh, to, to give us an idea of how to set up a, 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 and, and installing a, a Solo 2 and some of the problems you might run to on a motorcycle. Right. So um, the first step when you unbox your, your soul is definitely to find um, a spot to put in. And um, most of the um, integrated aim mounts uh, usually mount on the triple clamp so that the triple clamp is what you see on the first two videos, on the first two photos, um, when you have the fork sticking out. And something that is very, very common for motorcycles is that GPR uh, steering damper that actually takes the space that would be used for the solo. So we had to come up with uh, ways around that. And uh, so on the, on the photo on the left, I have it mounted in the, so I have a little, yeah, exactly right here. So I have a uh, bracket that mounts in the keyhole. So because it's a race bike, I don't have the key anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, so I have something that mounts right into there and that doesn't obstruct the, uh, the dash. And that's actually perfect right here. Uh, something that I saw this weekend that was actually really neat and I can send um, other pictures of it is that second picture in the middle uh, where it was mounted on top of the triple climb. There was more clearance on that bike. Um, in my case, I had the keyhole that was uh, that was obstructing that, that space, but this is a, an aftermarket um, upper triple climb and that was actually perfect. It was really sturdy. I believe that this person won't have a lot of uh, a lot of vibration on it and I have seen people mounted it. So the top picture on the, with the 227 on the top uh, where it's actually mounted on the fairings. And I put this one here because although this one might be more subject to vibration, we had talked about the fact that the antenna is, uh, is located at the top of the solo. Uh, this one would be the, the best position for what the solo is intended or how the solo is intended to be mounted. So with that one, you'd be having the solo that's vertical um, and you know, with the antenna on the top. But for motorcycles and most motorcycle applications, um, we're, go we're going to have it lay flat um, in the, either on the tank or uh, on the triple clamp. And um, a friend of mine actually has this really, really clever area, um, clever little mount that doesn't require to have any other bracket than the one that's in the box. Um, and it just uses two little um, 90 degree brackets and then uses a GoPro mount. The advantage of having that one is for people that have several bikes, you can just use that little GoPro clip um, and just move your solo from one bike to another. And that's actually really, really great. Um, I, I thought that was really clever. So I really like this one. Yeah. And, and the other way of doing that, if uh, it's not too expensive, I don't know the actual numbers, but with these little back plates 
can be purchased separately from your AIM dealer. And, uh, and then you can put those on different bikes and just move the, the, the system from one to another as well. Always exactly. available to you. The, uh, we, we talk about the antenna being up here in the top edge of the, of the solo and, and a lot of people lay them down. It's just the way that, you know, the way the bikes are built and then you're laying down sometimes, you know, your hel helmet's right down there. Uh, if you get your head down too low and the solo is mounted straight up, you can't even, you can't read the, the display, right? So a lot of people are laying them down. They, they still do pretty well, but in the, it, at the end of the day, the best GPS is going to come if, with a, when you have a good clear view of the sky to the top edge of that, uh, of that solo. So do the best you can. I've seen really, really good data from solo twos that are, that are laid down like this. So it's, uh, it is what it is. Okay. But, and it doesn't seem to be, um, it doesn't seem to be too bad in terms of data acquisition. I think the fact that it's yeah. open air and we're not in a, in any, yeah. you know, um, car or it's not obstructed by anything else, I think is, uh, is pretty decent. And the new GPS sensors that we have in inside of those, you know, picking up all of the satellites that we do and, and even the new solo twos doing it at 25 Hertz. It's a uh, GPS uh, quality is, is, is usually pretty low on our list. It's very, very good. So it's low on our list of things to worry about. So, okay. Uh, track detection. That's the next thing that uh, when people get one, they get it out of the box. They're, they're excited to get out on their bike and get going. Um, and of course you show up at the track. Uh, what are some of the problems you might run into there that you've seen? Yeah, so um, the one the one thing that uh, that happens in some some cases is that you have different track um, configurations, um, and NCM, the National Corbett Museum track, is actually a really good uh, a really good example of that. Um, so the way I set them up is uh, by just having the track management um, in the track management menu by just having an automatic um, track detection, and so in that way you just have to plug it and. Uh, on your first lap, whenever you cross the finish line again, it's going to detect which uh, which track configuration it actually is. Um, but this is also to bring. So this is a picture of my Solo Two DL. I think it's fairly similar in uh, in on the Solo Two. Uh, this is also to bring attention to the fact that you know the Solo Two is a lot more than just a lap timer. You just there's a lot more uh, integrated to it than just you know something that uh, is going to display your lap times and your and your predictive lap time. Uh, so. Yeah, I really invite everybody to just look into the menus and uh, see what the different modes are actually are. Um, there is, you know, there is a mode for um, performance if you were to take your motorcycle to a drag race. Um, just, just all of those different little menus. You can also, you know, change the change the name of the solo and the and the backlight and everything. So, uh, re it's really interesting to start looking into the menu and see what, uh, you know, what configurations you can have. Um, something also that I didn't think about initially is a lot of people complain about the, uh, the battery life. It is a GPS module, so the battery life is definitely going to be challenged. Um, there are ways to um, have the solo power off, you know, within, I think, five minutes or 10 minutes instead of 30. So um, everything is in there uh, in, the, in the menu, uh, in the menu button. Certainly, and and we we have the uh, you know, fairly easy process of plugging in on the on the DLs or on the standard solos to to put 12 volt power from the from the bike uh, as well right into the gauge. So, uh, pretty straightforward uh, if you need to do it that way too. The um, um, you mentioned the DL versus the solo, and uh, and 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 the power of both. Yeah, they're very very similar. The DL. Uh, the biggest main change is the ability to bring in ECU uh, data and, and and Lambda controllers and hook up a Smarty Cam. That's that's really the difference between the DL and the and the Solo Two. But the menus are very similar, and uh, and the actual data output that you'll see uh, that could could have come from either one when we're looking at the data today. So, perfect, perfect. Let's talk a little bit about. Okay, now we've 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 loaded it. We've get, we figured out the it figured out what track we were at everything is going along and now you're getting ready to download and then there's going to be some data in a data file here's uh just a little bit about that uh, what what is the um, what have you found has been some questions from some folks and uh and, and some different ideas about this topic yeah so uh the the really good thing about that uh the simple solo two is that you can actually derive uh math channels from it so um, on, on top of your GPS derived data channels where you have, you know, your speed, your lateral acceleration, longitudinal acceleration, uh, you can get your track position uh, in your lap times, which is what a lot of people use. 
Uh, you also have, you know, the integrated sensor derived data. So you can have the pitch roll in y'all. Um, and then we have, which I use uh, quite a bit, the lateral and in, uh, inline acceleration and the vertical G as well. Um, and then there are things that, you know, you can add afterwards when you are uh, playing in the space of uh, RS2 analysis, RS3 analysis, which are uh, your lean angle, which for a motorcycle is really interesting to look at. Uh, then you can derive uh, the acceleration G, the brake G, and the corner G, as well as the corner radius. And um, Matt actually in the in the comments made a really good point. If you uh, plug your solo to uh, to the bike's power, to the vehicle's power, you can get uh, the you know the battery voltage, which is an additional channel that actually tells you about the the health of uh, of your battery. So you know all of these um, are really actually really powerful and. As a, you know, a, a track day person or uh, somebody who's just beginning into racing, uh, you can you can see a lot. Uh, your track position derived from the GPS is actually going to tell you your race line, and the race line on the motorcycle is really, really, really important uh, because of that lean angle. It also is going to tell you where you're accelerating, um, where you're braking, and the lean angle that matches this. So, I don't yeah. want to get maybe too much in detail on that, but uh, these are really the the basic channels that I look at for uh, a solo two, and uh, um, and yeah, and they're really really powerful. Yeah, absolutely. Just a, just a small little box, really inexpensive data logger, a lap timer, but it's really is a, a small little data logger. Um, very very powerful on in the motorcycle world, in in all of our device, in all of our uh, you know vehicles. You can put these in, but but get, being able to calculate, and we're going to share with those these math channels that uh, Chloe has created and show you how they are actually working. Uh, in just a moment, but uh, being able to calculate that all from your solo uh, is 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 an amazing thing for the bike. I'm going to go back to a question that's in the question and answer box uh, that uh, that maybe we'll get to, maybe we could should have got to it a slide or two ago from Bridget. It says, "What would be the very first uh, to you, Chloe? What would be the very first step in getting aim onto my race bike?" And and uh, that would be what we'll handle with you, and then I'll I'll handle the second half, which is. Um, and does the AIM software continue to be able to be built upon with, with add-ons? So let me start with that one, and then I'll hand it back to you. The Ray Studio's software is, um, the, uh, we're, in the, we're in that transition from Ray Studio 2 to Ray Studio 3 analysis. We're going to look at Ray Studio 2 today. Um, Ray Studio 2 is pretty uh, uh, stationary at this point. It's very mature. It's, uh, it's working. There are lots of things you can do to get the data in and out, uh, spreadsheets, all tons of functions that you'll be able to to build things that you want. Uh, Ray Studio 3 will, will have a little bit more flexibility uh, being able to do some things with the data, uh, being able to take the data out or uh, chat with us. And uh, we're very open to uh, Emiliano is here, the, the software writer, uh, listening to this conversation and watching this, uh, be able to build some functions that uh, that can do some things that uh, maybe you're interested in that we, we haven't thought of yet. So, uh, but back, back to you, Chloe, Bridget talks about what, what is the first step to getting into to data uh, onto your motorcycle? I'm, uh, I'm going to say we've just hit upon it, right? It, it's this solo and, and the mountain and let's get it on there and get, get out there and, and start gathering some data, right? But I think also, a hey, hi, Bridget. Um, I think there is also a question versus that that's talking about uh, building upon the software versus building upon the, the hardware. If you're talking about building upon the software, it's actually um, it's actually awesome because you have those user profiles within uh, within uh, RS2 and RS3 analysis um, that really allow you to build to build um, different windows. So you can start with the one that I'm sharing, which is the very simple one where I'm looking at uh, the GPS feed and some GPS derived uh, channels. But then once you get more into it and you want to understand uh, more of the, the forces applied to the bike, you can start building your user channels or your user profiles uh, for you know, different graphs. And we can have you know, the, friction, the friction circles, et cetera. So as your understanding of data analysis grows, uh, I'd say you can start adding more and more features to the software. Um, but when if you're asking about the hardware parts, um, the Solo 2 is really contained in itself. So it's going to be the GPS, accelerometer, gyroscope inside. Um, if you wanted to build upon that, uh, I would say maybe start with something different. Maybe, you know, some, some hardware that is a little bit more advanced where you can start adding channels to it. Um, and that's going to be a discussion for another webinar probably. But I know Bridget has a, uh, a 2017 R6. So I would go with a DL just because the the protocol is awesome and has a lot of really interesting channels. Um, but 
the solo two deal is going to have the exact same basic as the solo two. So this really um, will work for uh, you know for any any solo platform or any aim platform, anyways. Bruce had a question that he asked a little bit ago that uh, that I'll take a little bit of a crack at and then hand it to you because uh, you you've just. Uh, uh, getting into this, but how difficult do you find it to navigate the data systems? You know, and again, we could probably talk hardware versus software, but reading th the rest of his question, he talks about he's a more of a hands-on person, not a PC person. The software is the software and it's and it's powerful. And there is a bunch of things that you uh, you just don't pick it up and go with it, right? We, we make it as, as user-friendly as we can and try to walk through and of course do you know, 99 webinars plus uh, plus another, you know, ton of uh, other uh, uh, YouTube videos that are out there. I think we've got 164 now total uh, of trying to give people some ideas of how to use the stuff, but uh, we do the best we can. But uh, what are you, you're, you're new to this about three years, I think you mentioned in your opening. Um, mm -hmm. If you picked it up pretty well, have you uh, found it to be not too terrible, difficult to navigate? I found it to be pretty standard. Uh, I think I do work with a lot of data analysis systems. Ah, yeah, um, so, so for me, looking at uh, you know channel versus distance or channel versus time graph is something that's pretty uh, that I'm pretty used to. For somebody who who just started, I think you know the the user profile that I'm sharing with this specific uh, webinar is probably the best way to start. Um, you wouldn't even have to build your own user profile. You can just uh, you know download or sorry upload the one that uh, that I'm sharing. Um, and then that actually shortcuts a lot of the work. Um, so I would say just find the user profile or that you know that you like, um, and then everything should be you know displayed on your on your screen. And just the more you use it, the better you better you're gonna get at it. So yeah, and there, and there's lots of uh, lots of these. Like I mentioned, there's there's quite a few uh, videos that are out there. Like this one here, download data to PC. Uh, I mentioned this is our 99th webinar, our very first webinar. The reason we're not going to go into a ton of the down, you know, details on downloading data is we're going to give you a link to go right straight to the uh, uh, an entire hour of talking about how to download the data, how to set all that up. There'll be a link in our in our uh, in our chat box, and there'll be a uh, a link down in the description below with uh, with those of you watching on YouTube later. So almost everything we talk about here will have uh, more detail uh, in, in some other videos. So you look for that. Okay. The um, that's uh, the the next thing. Once you've got the data onto the um, the uh, onto your computer, you've downloaded the data, you've looked at you know you got the basics, you've opened it up up the session. Uh, you mentioned to me while we were chatting that you have a, a process that we're going to actually talk about for a minute. But important to you is building of a track map because uh, you'd like to do segment reports and some other things as as, as kind of even sometimes a lead in. So uh, creating a track map. What um, when you look at this, you, we, we have a, a process of building track maps, which will we'll link two or three data uh, video files about uh, more detail on how to do this. But we always come up with uh, the AIM software comes up with a default track map that's shown here. And then we maybe tweak it a little bit. And I'll, we'll, we'll talk about that one in the next uh, next screen. What's important to you in a track map, Chloe? All right. So like you, like you mentioned and like you hinted at, um, I do like to start with um, looking at a predictive lifetime because a lot of people just, you know, come back from a session and like, oh, I saw a, you know, XXX like predictive life, lifetime that is, you know, a second or two faster. Um, and I like to start building my maps in order to actually look into their data to see, you know, in which area they were that much faster that, you know, the, the predictive lifetime could have potentially been. Um, so much better. Um, but what I found, you know, what I found out going uh, with the, uh, the track map that's auto-generated is that you, you can physically do what the predictive lab time is actually telling you. And that's also, that's also why I'm mentioning this here is also to bring awareness on, you know, what the predictive lab time is. It's a really, really powerful tool. Um, However, you want to make sure that you set up your uh, your track map in a way that's going to make your corners or your sectors achievable. So something that's really, really important for me is to make sure that um, I'm not cutting the corner in a way that is going to um, cut into two parts, what's an entry corner and what's an exit corner. So let's say you're going for you know one lap and uh, you decide to make this corner an entry corner. So you're going to be really late on the brakes um, to and you're going to sacrifice your drive. But then the next lap around, um, 
you're trying to set up a pass on the exit and uh, you're making it an exit corner. Well, you're in that one session, your solo is going to put that, with, you know, with the, the automatic map is going to put that together and it's going to tell you, well, make this corner an entry corner and an exit corner, uh, which is not physically possible. So what I like to do is cut my map in the way that actually gets the first breaking point and then the, and then the drive out of the corners. So if you go to the next slide, um, yeah, you can pay attention to maybe that very first corner. Um, this is turn one at Road America where we were with Moto America a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, the corner starts where the, the breaking point actually is. Uh, and then I'm making it continue a little bit where uh, my acceleration, so when I'm looking at my longitudinal G, when my acceleration is at the, the peak. So in that way, I encompass like everything that uh, could potentially happen, whether, and when I look at my sectors, then it can actually tell me whether um, it was more efficient to make it an entry corner or an exit corner. Gotcha. The, um, and we'll actually see that in the, this map is what's going to be in the data when we look at it. We'll actually look at where these segments are actually landing and it'll become even more clear. Uh, Sherwick asks the question, would you be able to show in a future webinar how to create the derived channel of the lean angle in degrees? Uh, well, just wait, wait a, a couple of slides maybe. And uh, I think you're going to see it. And then we're going to show you how, how it looks and, and works in, inside of the software. Great, great question. Understood exactly where we were heading. The, uh, but the next thing is now that we've set these things up, maybe we've created a track map. Uh, one of your most important things that, uh, and I think it is for, for all users, is, is there is this setting up of the actual screen and getting at what you, the data that you need to see, and not just from a speed standpoint, but, but actually getting it set up and, and understanding what you're looking at. Uh, and then of course comes the speed of being able to change from one to the other. Uh, your user profiles, what do you look for in Ray Studio 2 analysis from a solo two? Maybe that's a, maybe you can chat a little bit about <clears throat> how you kind of set your screen up. Yeah, so uh, the very first thing that I look at is going to be the GPS speed because that's, um, and from what everybody says, you know, um, when you're looking at data analysis in general for any type of platform or vehicle, you're going to look at the GPS speed. Uh, the GPS speed is extremely powerful. It tells you about everything that you uh, really need to know at a first uh, first sight. So um, from that, I can see you know where I'm starting to break, where the accelerations are. I can actually see all of my corners. Um, so this is going to be the top channels. And from that, usually that's where you start having questions. You start looking at different areas that uh, uh, that are of interest. Um, I then look into my acceleration. Uh, my accelerations, so the positive and the negative, which is going to be um, usually, you know, being when you're on the throttle and on the brake. Um, I'm doing this here because on the Solo 2, we do not have uh, brake pressure or throttle position. However, you know, this is a pretty good trick to actually see, you know, the forces that the bike is seeing. Um, so here it's basically looking at long, yeah, longitudinal. Uh, there's also a little trick where you can have a compound um, compound acceleration and braking where you're looking at uh, lateral and longitudinal. Uh, but this is for me the, the simplest one to look at. Um, and then I look at the lean angle because on the motorcycle it's actually really important. We have this idea that you have this hundred point of traction and I think this is from a, um, a Yamaha Champion Riding School video, I believe, uh, where you you cannot add lean angle as you're adding um, throttle, or you know you cannot be at 100% lean angle and 100% throttle, um, you know, in a transition. So you really want to make sure that you're doing everything fairly smoothly, um, but fast. So your change of direction on the bike uh, are going to be shown by your lean angle. And uh, here I have two lean angle channels. Uh, I think we can sort of yeah. disregard the one that's calculated. Uh, I just talked to Emilio and that's, uh, it's really interesting how AIM does uh, the, uh, the calculation in the background and uh, you know, us motorcyclists are actually not left out because the lean angle calculation does account for the change in the entire radius. So it's pretty, pretty powerful and pretty cool. Pretty interesting. And then, and then the, last, the last thing that I look at is the time compare. So um, the, the flat lap that we can't really see here is gonna be the, the exactly reference, cool. the fastest lap. Right, and then you can see the um, the time compare, and whenever the this graph actually goes up, then that's where the rider is losing time uh, compared to his uh, his best reference. 
the um, we, we always start with the speed. We've got this thing that we the, here we talk a lot about is the speed and lap times are the money channels, right? So almost all of our views always will have a speed trace. It, it, it is for that, but it's also a very easy way once you, as the data person, once you're playing around, you, you can look at these and know right where you're at, even with a track map in place, right? Once you know the track and the acceleration zones. Um, um, James Coburn mentioned, uh, caught, seen this and, and, and noticed it. And to me, this is, this is a little bit different. And uh, we're going to talk about why and, 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 and her acceleration channels. She does some things with them to build them to work best on the bike, but she's also built these where the positive is one channel. And while it looks like it's a, just a single trace, these are actually two different traces with zero right in the middle. And uh, so it's so we, we'll, we're gonna see in the data where she actually colorizes them maybe a little bit different where where green is acceleration and red is is braking and, and, and it helps when she's coaching uh, other folks as well. So kind of a cool little trick uh, there and James caught on it, to it pretty quickly too. So yeah. oh. there's really two reasons for that. Uh, the main one is that it clearly highlights the zero. So it clearly highlights the, the transition. Mm -hmm. um, and then the other reason is that I can actually filter everything that's below uh, 0.1 G. Uh, so the transition is actually uh, clearer because gotcha. usually you have a little bit of noise uh, when, it goes, when it goes close to zero. So that way I have a zero line and then I, have, I can see my transition and I can detect a lot faster if there is any cruising. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. Yep. Something we uh, yeah, off throttle rolling into a corner kind of a kind of a thing, which we'll look at. Uh, 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 Matt has a question about motorcycle racing in specifically how much, if any, does the rider turn the handlebars versus just leaning? Uh, what, you, what you said about lean is just like a driver in the steering wheel. Well, how much is, is the actual movement of the steering wheel versus just laying the bike over? Well, none at all. The, uh, <laughs> the, the steering actually does not does not move. Uh, most of the bikes not. Again, not a race bike, but if you if you get a, um, a a stock bike that you're gonna have on the street, uh, I think the steering locks um, after you know a few a few mph. So I think oh, it's like know. above maybe like ten or thirty or something like that. I don't know what the number is, but you, you don't. So you push you push on the handlebar to apply force for the counter steering, um, but this is just forces. the 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 bar actually doesn't doesn't really move. So it's uh, it's all a transfer of force between you know one side and the other. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Let's talk a little bit about this math channels. Uh, again, you're going to um, uh, in the links in the chat box here for those of you are live or for those of you watching it in the uh, uh, YouTube videos later. There, there the 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 links for this data the math channel uh, package, the AMC files for Ray Studio 2, the, the profiles that we're gonna load and look at here, it, here in a moment. And then the race, uh, I'm sorry, the, the uh, Road America track, the new one that we showed where she had adjusted those segments will all be available for you to download and import into your race studio. So here's, a, here's the math channel function. Uh, this happens to be the lean angle was the one that's highlighted from the, from the question earlier. Uh, chat a little bit about what, uh, what you're doing here, Chloe. Okay. So lean angle is the, I think the only channel in here that is uh, already provided by AIM. Mm -hmm. So uh, AIM has in the function window, if you wanna show like all the way and on the right. I can't here. scroll down to it, but it's down here just below the bottom. And we, I guess we could show in the live data yeah. also later. But so in that, in that list of function, there's a bunch of uh, mathematical function that you can use for uh, building, building functions or building math channels. Uh, but one that's already made and uh, um, that Emiliano worked on is the bike angle. So in that one, you just have to, uh, you know, import the bike angle or the, the channel into that little formula window. And then you just have to choose a speed channel and a gyro channel. Uh, for the Solo 2, it's pretty straightforward. You just use the, the GPS speed and the GPS gyro. Uh, and that calculates your bike angle that I was showing on the, on the window before. Uh, so that's pretty cool. It's actually really powerful. Um, I believe that with the new software, more uh, more channels are going to be added. Is that right? Some, some different math channels, and it's mm -hmm. going to be a totally different math channel functionality. But it's uh, a, a lot of obviously the same ones plus more will be on their way. Uh, and the way that you get to this math channel for those of you that are just starting out, uh, you can go to the modify 
and then math channel uh, pull down uh, menus, or there's a what looks like a, a, an equation in your toolbar. Uh, you can click on that and it'll open up this dialog box. Uh, there's a math, uh, there's a video, two or three video videos that we've done in the past that are linked uh, in our chat box and it'll be linked down below in the YouTube that talk about the, uh, uh, the, the background and how to use this and how to get the, the data from the general tab and into tests and, and how to import the data, uh, the, the math channels and all of that. So, but that, uh, veil, that import set that Chloe has provided us is available for a download uh, uh, by clicking on there and there's the name of it, what it would look like. So. Right. And that's, oh. that's a little bit cumbersome, I would say. And I think it changes in RS3 and I'm actually really happy about that. Mm -hmm. uh, every single time that you upload a session, you would have to go and add your, um, your math channels to it. Um, so you, anytime you come back for the data, they, they show up on RS2 analysis. Um, you go into that modify, log your data, uh, import your math channel. Um, but once you've done it once, everything is saved onto your computer with that, uh, those math channels already in it. So um, it's a matter of you know, 30 seconds. Um, when we get inside of the, the, the live data, I'll show you a quick little trick and everybody else that uh, to show how to automatically add those to, uh, these math channels into every test you ever open. So you don't even have to do that 30 second bit. Oh, that's we'll, awesome. We'll, we'll chat about that in just a second. Okay? I'm really, really interested about that. Yeah, yeah absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. So the other, the other thing that is, and I think this is one of the last slides we have before we jump into some live data, uh, on, it, creating that look that you wanted where those two acceleration channels were in their own little window and uh, and setting everything up you, you thought it was important that we we take a minute and uh, and make a slide here that uh, just talked about how to do some basic things I'll go over them real quickly and you give a little bit of more color on them if uh, if there's mm -hmm. something else you'd like to add but the per lap color is, is an important checkbox this is the measures and laps toolbar that's typically on the left edge of when you're looking at your data uh, if you want to uh, have your uh, all of your laps, all of your channels that you have active when you have two tests open, you check that. And then every data function from the, the test file will be green and every one from the qualifying file will be red. These are the two data files that you're gonna get and, uh, and we'll be looking at in a second. The other thing is, is there's a checkbox here to view the uh, y-axis scaling values. Sometimes people see this checkbox and they think that is in order to turn on the channel. That's kind of intuitive, but it's but it's not. You turn on the channel by clicking right on the name, and then you click on these checkboxes to turn on the scaling that's along the edge. If uh, if you're in the uh, in the mixed views, which we're gonna have a whole video, uh, a link to a couple of videos where we talk about setting up uh, the views and all, and all of that stuff that you can uh, watch in a little bit. But uh, the mixed view selector, uh, it, it, there are some numbers here. If you are in the mixed view, then you have some little row of numbers here where you can actually tell it that I want speed in window number one. I wanted, you know, the uh, the, the lateral G's and and two and 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 merging the two of those together, right? And then you have your lean angle and your lean angle calculated that we're going to look at a little bit, and both of those are in four. So that you, that's how you're moving stuff around inside of the inside of the window. And finally, uh, there's a sort channels button in there that we can actually put these in an order that makes some more better sense to you, maybe. So just we wanted to go over a little bit of this measures and laps toolbar to give everybody an idea of how to kind of move stuff around real quickly. Some of you have uh, have, have done a lot of that, so uh, but we wanted to cover that. Uh, anything you'd like to add about Chloe, Chloe, about that? Is there something there that uh, is, is was important to you that really helps you? No, I think you covered it all. Um, the moving, toggling on and off the lab color is really useful when you're going from comparing sessions to you know just looking at one lab analysis. Um, I really like that, and the, the reason why I have this here is because. Actually, last weekend I was at the track and I saw a few people that had uh, solo twos. And my first question was, "Oh, you know, how do you like it?" And um, and my friend, who's actually our coach director, told me, "You know, you know, it's really cool, but apparently it's supposed to give you your RPM." And he had a two DL in that case, it's supposed to give you your RPM, but uh, I don't see it. And uh, you know, my first question was, "Well, did you ever plug this to a, com a computer and did you set your uh, configurations?" Um, and he had not done it, so. You know, it's, I, it's really, it's really powerful. You can do a lot of, uh, a lot of data analysis on your computer, uh, but it's nice to know, you know, what you can see and how you can, how you can display it. How, so, you, set it, how um, you set it up. Right. And so I spent a little bit of time just, you know, setting up the different uh, screens and then setting up the, the computer to his liking. Uh, but I put what, you know, what he liked at the time. And then, you know, if you get into it more and you learn more about it, it's nice to see what you can add and how you can add it. 
um, you know, the user profile, like to, to Bridget's point, um, you know, it's really modulable. You know, you can add on to it and build upon it um, pretty quickly. And Bridget had that question. I think uh, a couple of people took a shot at answering it. Bridget, give me give me a call or or write me an email note. The email list will be at the end, and we'll talk about the Solo Two versus the Solo Two DL. Uh, but it sounds like from uh, what Chloe Chloe knew what you had as a bike, and she was pretty pretty uh, pretty clear really quickly that the DL was probably the better one for you. So, uh, and one more story. You just mentioned you were at the track last weekend, and uh, and you and you mentioned it last night when we were chatting. That you probably had three hours in, of your day that was explaining people how to set up their screens, right? And um, mm -hmm. I went to uh, I went to an event this weekend uh, at, a, at a local dirt uh, oval track near me where there was a, a large national sprint car race. But and then some of the support classes were there that uh, you know there was a Ford Focus midgets and 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 dwarf cars and some other things. And uh, so I'm walking around the the, the paddock area just uh, and I turned on my phone. And uh, and put it onto the Wi-Fi list, and and there were three AIM devices that were turned on as I was walking around somewhere in the paddock area. So I took a little bit of time. I wandered around, and I ended up finding all three of them. And uh, and there, all three of them needed a little bit of help of setting up their window so they could actually understand it better. So I, I, I what you ran into is exactly what I've run into as well. So I uh, th this this has happened um, a couple of times where I actually detect them and then see them and see that they have they're in need of a firmware update. So it's actually a pretty good icebreaker. I just, you know, introduce exactly. myself. I go see the people. I'm like, okay, so I detected your solo, and uh, it seems like you need a, a software update. Can I, can I help you? Yeah, and almost everybody is willing to 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 take that help as well. Obviously, so the 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 next thing I'd like to do. Um, uh, is let's jump into some live data and let's uh, let's take a look at what this looks like. We can maybe open up a couple of the functions and show them real quickly. We've got about 15 minutes to uh, to just kind of go around and show a little bit of, of how you analyze data from a solo. So let me let me bring up Race Studio and. Um, um, Here's here's that data file. I've only got the, the testing uh, session open right now. We'll we'll compare the data here in just a moment. But a couple things I wanted to go over real quickly that we actually chatted about. Here's the math channel function. Uh, I'll, I'll open that up. And the um, here's the lean angle that um, that uh, Chloe was talking about. And and it's the bike angle. And if you come over in, into the functions, if you were trying to build it. You of course can do the import set that we uh, that we've made available to you, but there's the uh, the bike angle is is down here, and there's some other stuff as well that uh, that we can go into at, at a later date. But when you when you when you build a function, you could have just double clicked this and put it into a new one, and it's going to ask you what is your speed channel, what is your gyro channel, mm -hmm. and boom, this thing is ready to go and give the, the the motorcycle racer these lean angles that are that are so critical in the way that we you analyze data. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and I want to jump. So I see Patrick had a question asking about a math channel that highlights a neutral throttle zone. Um, that's that's actually a really good point to start on for the live data analysis. Um, that's the main reason why I actually have the uh, the positive acceleration and negative acceleration in two different channels is because you can directly see where uh, where the transitions are are being a little bit. Uh, um, lazy, I would say, and you see that, uh, yeah. So one that's actually really, really good is uh, the last uh, back straight at uh, at Road America. Uh, so if you're looking at, I think it's number nine, right here, and you go down, right, and you go down to the the negative acceleration, you can see that it is at zero for quite a bit, uh, just before that, the B, oh. before the B, you can see that it is at right, zero, right, 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 right this here. flat area it is at zero for quite a bit. So you can imagine that here he's at full throttle. He's like holding the gas and then eventually, you know, um, there's no acceleration because the, the bike is at constant speed. Um, and then he's gonna get into braking and you see the braking going down and then there's a little bit of a transition. Uh, so where you were right before, actually you're right. Um, mm -hmm. yep. Then coming back yeah, up. And then you yeah. see the little bit of a transition. So first you see that the transition is not quite straight. Um, there's a little bit of a blip here. Uh, usually you want that to be as straight as possible where the that's the release of the brake when the that curve actually goes up. Um, and then the transition back to the throttle has a little bit of a of a disconnect. And that's usually what you see where you see that there is a little bit of a uh, uh, of a neutral throttle zone. So every time that I see a disconnect where that uh, 
that red curve, which is the deceleration, uh, goes up and does not transition right away into uh, into the acceleration into that green curve. That's where I detect that there is some kind of a neutral neutral zone. So you see one in the first sector as well, in that red yeah. sector. You can you can see one where it goes up and then it flat, flattens a little bit and then goes into the acceleration. So there, mm -hmm. uh, and you can actually pick that up pretty quickly when you're looking at uh, at the uh, the GPS speed. So the GPS speed does not do a full V. It actually just looks like a U, yeah. and you can see you can see that little flat spot. So that's where you can start picking up uh, the different um, areas of improvement. I would say. Yeah. Let, let's jump back real quickly into the the math channels for a couple of things. Yes, Number one is we talked about automatically adding math channels into every test you open from that, that point forward, right? So we've got this list. And if that list, I've got the AIM standard ones, and then I've got uh, your list that you had built here mm -hmm. under the general tab. And when they're in the general tab, you have the ability here to click this little checkbox that automatically insert into files. So it, it, since that one is checked, if, I were, if you were to send me or you were to download and open the files up in your computer with that one, these checked that the, those all those uh, math channels would automatically be added you do not have to do that every step which is kind of a handy thing so so if you look down across i also did overwrite because we were going back and forth with math channels with different names and you know fine-tuning stuff for today so i was overwriting the channels with the same name but uh, normally you don't even need to have that one but but each one of these i'm just automatically inserting so if i open up any tests from now on all of your math channels will be in there so, you're my hero pretty yeah uh, pretty it's a pretty <laughs> handy little thing Right, right. Like you just saved me probably, you know, 15 yeah. minutes a day. Uh, a couple of minutes in, in every download, right? It's it's, right, it's, right, exactly. it's those little things. It's just like your user profiles we're going to talk about in a second. They are a big thing on saving time, you know, everything mm -hmm. you can do to do that. You 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 talked about, um, and I thought it was kind of interesting, this Excel negative and Excel positive. You've actually got math channels that are here. And what um, what are you doing with those in order to make that different than a... Uh, than just the standard GPS longitudinal G's where we're accelerating as, as normal. So, so when you're looking at it in, the, in that channel, so it actually takes um, the, uh, it, it, it basically is a, um, a high pass filter or low pass filter. Um, so it takes, uh, it's a conditional statement that's looking at um, if the longitudinal acceleration is below minus 0.1, um, keep it, and if it's above, if it's not below minus 0.1, just get rid of it and make it make it zero. And then for the the positive acceleration, I have the opposite. So if it's greater than 0.1, uh, keep it. And if it's not, uh, make it zero. So it, you're looking completely at just uh, longitudinal acceleration right here, and it's just filtered uh, to get rid of one side and get rid of the other. And that way yeah. you can just have them on top of each other, filter the the middle where it's like between. 0.1 and minus 0.1 where it's a little bit noisy and then um and just have that zero line yeah again making that zero line very very nicely defined for uh for changing of these colors and making it where it's very easy for people to see as you coach them and, uh, and matt matt is mentioning that i could use a high pass filter and a low pass filter yeah. Yeah. yes i could and i just didn't know about that initially yeah. so i just there made my life my life harder <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 it's different ways, right? We, there are a lot of tools yeah. like that in, in our AIM software where people want to do it one way. Well, we just make sure that you have the option to do it that way. An, another one that you that you have done that I thought was kind of interesting, and uh, we'll get into the actual data here in just a quick second, but you've got these acceleration you know, G's, break G's, and corner G's, and they're, they're set up in a, in, a, in a way that um, is kind of interesting to me. Uh, what have you done here for acceleration? So I actually, uh, and I need to give him credit because he's awesome. Uh, I grabbed these channels from uh, a, a racer called uh, Nolan Lemkin, who is racing in uh, a Moto America Super Sport. He is the only person that I know in the Moto America paddocks who just made his entire season's data available for everybody. And so I should send you that link. Uh, he has he has a website and he has all of his data, all of his mass channels from this, the 2020 season completely available, which has been extremely useful for me because then I have all of his track maps, not his track maps, but I, I can build my track maps ahead of going to the track. And um, and that's what he did. And these are actually just compound um, acceleration channels that actually have, so he calculates the corner G based on the lateral. He calculates the acceleration and the break G based on the longitudinal. And then he puts them together 
uh, as trail brake and trail acceleration. So when you have these two, and if you want to overlay them on the on the data, it's actually pretty interesting to see. They're not as I would say they're not as straightforward to understand because they're not just this big V shape for the braking. However, it actually gives you some really cool information on uh, when when you're braking straight away, straight ahead, straight away, sorry, and when you're braking when you're leaning. Um, so it's it's more of a I would call it just a compound acceleration uh, that that encompasses both of them. It's kind of like um, so a lot of a lot of the folks that are watching this that are that are into cars. It's kind of like a G sum channel, but it's but it's a, a little bit better defined for for the motorcycle uh, world where 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 they're leaning in and trying to to understand that a little bit better. Right, so. it's basically a G sum channels that just cut into two two yeah. areas: the acceleration and the and the braking. Yeah. yeah, it's very 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 cool. So the uh, let's go ahead and jump out of the math channel side here real quickly, and and then let's real quickly before we dump jump into um, run out of too much time and we have to. I do want to look at a little bit of data, but I want to look at your user profiles real quickly that you've shared with everybody. And uh, and, and there, there really are three of them that uh, that are out there that folks will be able to look at. And uh, it's called Solo2 Main. And then you've got one that's called Solo2 Track Report and Split Times. And and your normal process is to kind of get in here and look at split times pretty quickly. So, but let's, uh, let's load the main, which I think is what's already loaded. That's but, like, yeah. um, and then you have this, and then you have the, uh, you have a GPS map in the background. And you've, uh, and what you've done here is, is you've got your lean angle is the colorization. And I thought that was kind of interesting. So you can kind of, the darker, darker blue is, is leaning, you know, one direction and, and the darker red and you can see here maybe there wasn't quite as much of a lean angle here as it was in this corner kind of interesting if you want to look at the gps map that way but right, the, i usually uh, look at the uh at the gps speed on I mean, it i don't i don't really know why the the lean angle was loaded but it's actually really interesting to look at it like that uh, i changed that for you last night and i tried to cover that real quickly for you but because since i forgot to tell you i did it but uh, <laughs> but uh the other interesting thing is is the since since you do rely a little bit on these track maps we we can have the track map down here in the corner and we mm -hmm. see exactly where uh, uh, where you are and the uh, and, and the measures and uh, and there's that uh, positive and, and, and acceleration and there's the two lean angles but uh, like you said we would probably get rid of uh, get rid of one of those yeah. uh, you also then have a a, a, a a track report that you like to go to so let's load that one real quickly and and what's valuable here when you're looking at it either yourself or you're coaching other folks what do you like the track report for so um, I, I don't specifically use the track report for myself, but I, I realized that a lot of people are not specifically, um, they have a harder time just learning from squiggly lines. Uh, they're not as um, used to looking at squiggly lines. So this is just a matter of uh, different, you know, different coaching style or different, um, different learning styles. So uh, a, lot of a lot of people will understand, uh, you know, their transition or their, uh, their performance a lot better just looking at uh, a gradient of college. So, you have this one with the sectors and you have the minimum and maximum. I think it's the speed in here uh, or the minimum speeds and yeah. maximum speeds. Uh, but, you know, sometimes it's just really nice to see um, the color transition from when you start breaking where your where your hardest breaking point is or, you know, speed where your lowest speed point point is and uh, and when you start accelerating again. So, you know, just just turning that into a GPS gradient is uh, is pretty self-explanatory and some people just you know, respond a lot better to that. Yeah, um, it, 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 you've just found it to be a tool that um, uh, maybe you found it on some of our, our webinars or not, but it, you found it a tool that some people will understand a little bit better than the squiggly line. So that's kind of exactly. interesting. Yeah. And then, then you've got your split time uh, analysis. One of those things that um, uh, when we were chatting, the uh, everybody has a different process that they like to go through. And, and you talked about, you open it up, you, you download your data, you take a look at the, the squiggly lines first uh, real quickly. But one of the things you like to do is come right into the uh, right into the split report. What's the first couple things you do when you look at data in a split report? So yeah, when I, whenever I load a, an entire um, session that was gonna have a few laps. So the first thing that I do is I, I disabled the in-lap and the out-lap that are not complete lap. Uh, because they, they skew the, the predictive. Um, and then I really use this to have a first, uh, a first look at, okay, what, which laps are going to be interesting to look at? I don't want to, you know, if it's a qualifying session and I have 15 laps, um, I don't want to overlay 15 laps, that's, uh, that's a lot of processing time. Um, so I actually just look at, 
this uh, the split report and I try to get so first the the best rolling lab which is the one that's highlighted in a uh, um, yeah, in the yellow. The, the yellow. Yep, yep. So I get, you know, lab five and lab six because that's my best rolling lab. And then, you know, if there is another lab that has a lot of blue sectors, which is the one that, uh, uh, which is which are the fastest sectors, I, I tend to grab that. So specifically for that session, I would go with, you know, lab five and lab six, uh, just not to be too overwhelmed. And I would load that and start looking at these two. Um, and it, it's really, it's really a selection. And it's also, you know, if, if I trust the way I build the map, uh, it's also a pretty good idea of okay, what can you do? Um, what you know, what lab time is achievable now that I now that I know that my map is actually a little bit more reliable. Um, and uh, I actually created a code where I export all this data, but that's that's something that I'm doing on the side as well. Um, you know, just kind of a next step where if I have a lot of lab, uh, that actually this code just finds the best sector and then reproduce the best possible um, like slope or, or graph, for example. So it grabs all of the data based on that split report basically and then uh, and then rebuilds everything. So that's also a pretty good indication of what you know what the bike can do. Another very uh, a strength that Chloe has is obviously she's an engineer. So when uh, when she sees some data, she wants more data, right? And more ways of looking at it. And you can export the data out of, of virtually every function inside of Race Studio 2. The uh, the other thing that's uh, interesting is in Race Studio 3, we're not talking about that here today, but there is, uh, when you're in a split report, you actually can click on and get that segment and see all of the uh, uh, the actual trend lines. Uh, we don't do averaging and some other things that you do, but uh, um, maybe we're getting closer to doing something like that. The it other thing that's really, kind of cool really about really this, cool. Yeah, the other thing that's kind of interesting, if you bring up your track map and save it as part of your user profile and put it down here in the corner, mm -hmm. uh, the, the the numbers will go away for those of you who haven't played with this too much. But when you get at such a size, the, the corner numbers start to appear. And now if you can't remember exactly what that blue number four was, you can come in here real quickly and figure out exactly which corner that was. Right. So having your track map open in a in a during viewing of a split report can be pretty handy. I just wanted to yeah. talk about that. Okay, so let's jump back in and let's 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 reload the the main profile here real quickly, and um, uh, and and would you like to to look at this a little bit, or would you love to bring this the second uh, session when the driver act, the rider actually qualified? Which would you like to do next? Oh, uh, we can we can bring the LD session on. Uh, okay, let's get on. that yeah. one and let's go ahead and add. Let's go ahead and jump in here and add the qualifying session. And let's see, uh, we just got a couple of minutes left. I, I, we, we chatted about a lot of other things, which has been kind of fun. But uh, we'll, we'll go in here and we'll, uh, we'll actually just maybe look at a little bit of this and maybe you can chat about what you see, uh, where, where the driver, the rider made some, some real gains. And, uh, and just as you're thinking about that, let's, let me cover something that I think it was James Colburn mentioned that uh, people that are, we got a number of people who have raced here at Road America quite a bit, and they're all seeing the what I saw yeah. yesterday when we were looking too, right? Normally in the sports cars the, and the folks that race there, they come around the carousel and they just go on down uh, the, the back straightaway and into Canada corner. But there is in this data, that's why you're seeing a little bit of a strange uh, area. There is a chicane for the bikes. So uh, yeah. we did want to cover that. James, no, you did not forget your way around Road America. This is uh, <laughs> this is the bike uh, layout. So exactly. Chloe, let's chat a little bit about what you see here uh we just got a couple more minutes but talk about a little bit about uh the testing versus the qualifying and where the driver found some uh speed and and, and where they found that speed right so uh these are two extremely different laps i think that's uh the first session out on the uh, on a weekend or i think on that monday before it was a track day and then uh and then the qualifying session before the race so i mean we can really see the lap times are quite different i think it's going from a 44 to uh to a 39 so it's it's five, pretty, five um, it's pretty drastic, uh, but it's really interesting to see where the the areas of improvement have been. And uh, you know, the the first thing you usually see is uh, a rider is going to go, you know, faster on the straight and going to start breaking later. So that's the first thing you see into turn one, where you know there is probably a I can't really see it's like a thirty maybe four, uh, four miles an hour difference, and then a uh, yeah. a break, a break a breaking point that's a lot a lot. Uh, further so you can start seeing um you know things like that um then we can see so in 
on a on a race weekend, and that's very different from what a track day is going to be. On a track day, I'm going to look at um, you know the the cruising points on the on the acceleration curve. Uh, I'm going to look at their lean angle on a you know um, a Moto America weekend where I'm working with somebody that just has a solo. Like this is the case here. We're looking at when they start breaking, how hard they're breaking, when how how their transition or uh, how effective their transitions are. And we're looking at gearing. And um, in that case, um, I think Giacomo mentioned the, the gearing. So the XY plot RPM speed, yes, uh, when I have RPM. So the solo two does not uh, log RPM. In that case, what you can, the only thing you can really see is your, your drive. So you can see that acceleration going from, so if you're looking from um, turn one, uh, at the end of turn one, you can see the transition from the negative acceleration to the positive acceleration, which kind of yeah. correlates with the uh, the yeah the slope of uh, of the acceleration. So this will indicate your drive. In general, you know, when the the higher your corner speed, the faster your drive is going to be, and then the higher your corner speed, the faster your uh, your top speed is going to be. So here we're looking at uh, SV650 motorcycles that are not extremely powerful. I mean, the engines are built uh, for the Moto America series, but uh, I think a stock engine is 75 horsepower. A built engine is going to go up to uh, 90 something, you know, 97, maybe at the max. Um, and so when you're at a track like Road America, horsepower or draft or, you know, top speed is really, really going to matter. So you want to look at everything that's going to give you that top speed on the exactly that uh, that middle straight that you can see here. Um, here there's actually a very interesting um, behavior that, uh, and I need to talk to this writer because I don't exactly understand what happened. Maybe he was drafted or maybe yeah. on the other, maybe on that blue curve, something happened and he was actually um, held up by somebody, but his, his corner speed was low. Uh, and you can see on that red curve in the, in the second sector, his corner speed was much lower, but then his drive was, was actually pretty okay, like similar to the, to the blue curve. Then he hit a bump and you can see it in the, in the acceleration, um, but his speed continued to increase um, with quite a bit of a difference actually, which was eight, I think eight, eight miles an hour. Yeah, about four right there in this so particular four miles case. An hour yeah. here. Uh, four miles an hour on that back street, which is actually you know, quite a bit. And then probably, you know, it was the first practice. Uh, maybe he got scared a little bit and he started breaking early. And that's something that yeah. you see a lot uh, between happening between, you know, the first sessions and the last sessions where whenever a rider starts going faster, they move their braking marker, you know, a lot earlier because, you know, because of a little bit of fear, because, you know, it, it takes more time to break. Um, it really depends. So it's a matter of discussing with them. Um, also, when you have the brake pressure, you can definitely see, you know, the braking power if they're braking too early or if they can actually um, push their brake marker. In that case, you can see the slope of the of the uh, longitudinal braking uh, based on the based on the longitudinal acceleration or deceleration, um, and you can see the shape of that curve, and you can actually see that this racer could potentially break harder. There is a lot of you know, negative acceleration that's constant at, uh, um, you know, in the, at the bottom of this curve. Um, there could be, there could be a more efficient braking possible in that, uh, in that area. And you can see the difference in here again in our money channel, right? The, yeah, the, the, the practice lap was a little faster here, but the, in the, um, um, uh, the qualifying lap being in blue in all, in all the technical areas that, you know, the, the, the speeds are, are substantially higher. I wanted to go, we don't, we're, we're at pretty much out of time, but I did want to look at this, the carousel on a motorcycle. And you mentioned earlier in the, in the conversation, you had this, this lean angle thing on a bike, which we've calculated down here. And you can see the red being the practice and the blue being the qualifying the, you know, there's a, there's an additional 10 degrees of lean angle. And look at the difference in the in the speed and um, the uh, and and it's crawling up pretty pretty quickly, but the lean angle is pretty uh, steady. So the rider is just leaning more and more and more into the throttle and uh, and has the bike leaned way over. Uh, kind of an interesting thing and something that you said you look at pretty quickly. Yeah, yeah. So you can actually really see uh, where the speed increases is about at the time that uh, that the lean angle is uh, is decreasing. 
So if you're going, if you're going a little bit further where the lean angle is going back to zero, back uh, between here. seven and nine, you can actually see that's where he's getting on the throttle, but he's getting on throttle and removing lean angle because you need that traction. You need to get back up. You know, you, you want to be at full throttle um, as soon as you're up, up and down. Um, and then you're getting into that chicane area. Um, and so you have a very, very fast transition in lean angle where it's going left, right, oh, right, pop, right. pop, pop. Yeah. And, and you're on the brakes and, and you, and you meant it's, it's critical. You can't be in the super high lean and, and obviously you know, transition from throttle and onto the brake. So it's funny. You can see where they stood the bike up, started the mm -hmm. braking. And yeah. then went ahead and started that process of the, the left, right through the chicane. Interesting right. stuff. And you can see, you know, something that's also really interesting with the negative acceleration is you see that they're going back up that acceleration curve uh, when they're adding the lean angle. So they're doing most of their braking straight up and down and then releasing trailing of the brake, getting into the corner. And that's, you know, that's motorcycle basics, which fundamentals are really, really important. So yeah. this is really good, you know, application of the fundamental. Very, very interesting. The uh, and all from a solo, and but and that was really uh, we're kind of out of time to to dig in too much more. But the uh, all very interesting stuff, and all hundred percent from a from a standard non ECU uh, solo, right? Just a solo two, uh, not the DL, and you can get all of this information directly out of that. Uh, what we're going to do in in future um, um, sessions with Chloe is we're going to bring in the next step where we'll have some. Uh, a logger data that has the RPM and, and maybe some some additional channels. Maybe it's going to be throttle. Maybe it's going to be brake. At different times, we'll uh, we'll continue to to increase what we're looking at in in the in the uh, motorcycle analysis. So it'll be fun. Okay, perfect. There's the I'm going to jump back to the um, to the uh, PowerPoint and start to kind of close it up a little bit. The, the uh, again, just so everybody, uh, if you came in a little bit late, the the data that we were just looking at, the user profiles, the math channels, the Road America map that she was talked about, and how she broke that up for her for her splits to be in the correct spot as far as the the way she likes to do it is all available for you and download. It's down there in the description box uh, down here below if you're watching this on YouTube afterwards. Um, very, very good data to play with and learn about. It's got the math channels, uh, everything that we just kind of chatted about. Uh, go ahead and download that and, uh, and, and take a look at it. The, uh, uh, all of the videos that we've done through all of these, uh, we're up to 164 videos on our YouTube site. Uh, all of uh, uh, this being number 99, uh, uh, of course, all of those are there as well. Um, the uh, fantastic uh, amount of information there for everybody. So take a look at it. The uh, And yes, number 100 is next uh, next week. And we're going to talk about what our, uh, our next webinar will be in just a moment. But uh, number 100 since we started uh, ne next Tuesday, a week from today. The uh, customer support. Uh, we're a customer support company that happens to sell racing electronics. That's the way we kind of like to, to talk about it here. Uh, Chloe being just a, such a strong customer support person also for the folks that she's, she's uh, coaching. It's just, uh, it's the way that's the right way to do, do things. It's the right way to treat people. And of course, the right way to do business and, and give us a holler if you need anything uh, for your AIM products, software, hardware, uh, give us a look for us at the track. If you, if, we're, if you can't find us there, call us at the 800 number or email us. Uh, let us, let us help you make sure you get the most of uh, everything you've got from us. So uh, next week, a uh, week from today, we are going to have an update on uh, Race Studio 3 analysis, uh, beta software uh, update number eight. Emiliano, who is here in the background, been answering questions and, and uh, in, interacting with everybody in the chat, is going to be uh, our, our co-host. Uh, there have been a lot of updates in uh, Race Studio 3 uh, beta that uh, have not been uh, released yet. Uh, I don't know exactly when we're going to release that next one. It's my hope it'll be the, the morning of or maybe the day before uh, this discussion. So those of you that do have Race Studio 3 beta, maybe start to be clicking on and looking at that little cloud up there as we get a little closer to our, uh, to our Tuesday um, webinar next week uh, and get, a, get the fresh update as we're, uh, as we're gonna talk about with Emiliano uh, what, what some of those bug fixes were and then some of the enhanced stuff. There's some pretty cool stuff that they have added in that, uh, that I think you'll, uh, that you will like. So look forward to that next Tuesday with uh, Emiliano, gonna be a good time for that. And then we're gonna start into the, uh, some deep data analysis ones, as I mentioned, uh, for most of July and August. So that'll be kind of fun. Uh, contact information. Uh, if you uh, would like to get a hold of Chloe to, to, to 
to take advantage of some of her coaching activities, uh, some of her information on uh, data analysis on motorcycles. Uh, there's some information down there. She's a, she's a pretty busy lady uh, with work. And then of course the hobby of motorcycle racing and then uh, dry, rider coaching, uh, pretty busy stuff, but there's an email address down there. And I'm sure that uh, she's up there putting some images on, on her Instagram account uh, all the time as well. So that's a picture of her um, out there racing on her bike right there. So uh, I don't know why I picked that one, except for maybe that uh, AIM sticker that's right there on the, on the cowling. So maybe that's why I picked that picture. So, but uh, Chloe, I appreciate you coming. I, uh, we, we've, uh, uh, the number of, of emails and calls I get from folks wanting more motorcycle information has been high. And, uh, and so uh, I think we found the perfect person with you to come in and chat with us and then grow this into even more in-depth uh, uh, data analysis on motorcycles in the near future. Again, I thank you for your time. It's, I know it's a very busy, uh, busy time for everybody and uh, you taking the time to put all this together has been very helpful. Is there anything else that you'd like to add as we're kind of, uh, kind of closing this one down? Uh, well, yeah, first you're very welcome. That was awesome. Um, no, anybody uh, who wants to reach out, I, uh, I coach with a, an organization called Track Day Winner. Um, so I will be at most of the events uh, unless I am at Moto America. Uh, I will be at the Ridge in Washington for the first time there uh, this uh, this weekend, actually. So, you know, stop by and say hi. Uh, you can reach out to my email address, reach out uh, via Instagram. That's usually where I share most of the motorcycle stuff and it's basically only motorcycles. Um, and uh, yeah, and I'm really looking forward to coming back. Looking forward to you being here in our uh, our lovely state of Washington. Uh, I, I might try to drop uh, drop by on one of the days. It's a, it's a little awesome. bit of a jaunt for me, but I but I might want to uh, run down there and say hi to you and see some of the the super fast motorcycle guys that'll be racing around there. It's a cool track, so looking forward to it. Thanks everybody for coming. Thank you again, uh, Chloe, for joining us. Look forward to having you back with us in about a month or two, uh, and and talk about more. Thanks everybody for being here. Look forward to seeing you all uh, next Tuesday. Talk to you then. Bye bye.